Just to let you guys know, um, we're only doing two songs, so if the youth want to get going, that's on you. Um, we're going to do worship at the end. If you guys want to come back later, you're more than welcome to. But I just thought I, just thought I wanted to change something up tonight. Um, last week, if you were here, we went through two chapters, and I thought, you know what, I got to give the, right, you weren't here last week. I got to give you guys a break after going through two chapters. You're going, man, that was like unheard of for this place. And uh, being in Genesis and being where we were at, 29 and 30, it just kind of went together. There was a lot of reading. There was a lot. And I don't know if I'm doing this break for you or for me. But no, um, I had been praying about doing something different this week. I thought I was going to have somebody here to share about five, 15 minutes of what's going on, and he wasn't feeling great. And I said, great. He goes, oh, I feel so bad. Go, we didn't even announce you were going to be here. So <laughs> no. if I wouldn't have said anything, you guys would have never known. And so my heart tonight, as I was praying about tonight, because I still wanted to come up and share a little bit, but also we want to get into some communion a little later and then do some worship. And, um, and so I, I, whenever I want to change things up like that, I go, Lord, give me one of your psalms that I can just dwell in and uh, be a part of. And so for some reason, I had gone to a couple of Psalms, and then I read Psalm 29. So if you will, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 29 tonight. Um, just kind of want to share this portion, because when I read it, all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, this is, this is powerful here. Powerful in the sense that God, the God that we serve, is a powerful God. And, and I think oftentimes when we're going through things in our life and we feel like, ah, oh, so defeated, so down, and we cry out and it feels like God is not hearing us, He does, He really does, because He's involved in every aspect of life. And, and when we read a psalm, and I, I love the fact that the ladies, you women, are going to be going through the book of Psalms, right? And to me, I, I tell people when they're just struggling with life, you know, live in Psalms for a little bit because it teaches you how to worship when you're up. It teaches you how to worship when you're down. It just teaches you how to worship. And when I read Psalm 29, it just brought me to a place of worshiping the Almighty God for who He is. And, and the fact that this is the God that we serve. And so I want to read all of uh, Psalm 29. And then we'll go back and, and however I can try and do it some justice, I'll, I'll try to do it some justice. But I just wanted to share this portion with you guys before we partake in communion and then get back into worship. And, um, you know, if, if, if the Lord lays it on my heart to have a prayer time, we'll have a prayer time too. But... Um, for, for right now, communion and worship in the Word. So let me read Psalm 29. Give unto the Lord, you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like the, like the young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And, his, and in his temple, everyone says, glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. The Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. When, when, when we go through it and we, 
we st- and, and I kind of want to break it down a little bit, but you start reading this and you're going, oh my gosh, there's, there, there, there's this talk about strength and power and glory and, and all of these things. And, and you could almost envision David who writes this psalm. And I was envisioning, because I often stand by the doors out here and just kind of look out there and you can see forever, especially on a clear day. You could see the peak, one of the peaks of the Sierras on a very clear day after it has snowed here. There's a peak way out there, and it's about a 180-mile straight shot. And so you could see. And sometimes when, when, when we start seeing some of the storms kind of roll through, you know, and you can be here and it's not raining, but you're going, it's raining over there. And you just can, can, can just watch it. And I'm that kind of guy that can sit there for a while and just watch everything go on. Or you see the mountains and you see all the glory and all the beauty, especially from this side looking that way. And there's all this snow and blah, blah, blah and all this stuff. It's just, oh, and you're just like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And so you can appreciate nature. And, and so you can appreciate how King David, the, the writer of this psalm, is probably in a place where he's, he's maybe on a, on a hill, but he could see the valley, but he could see to the north, and that's what he's picturing, and that's what he's looking at. And it's almost like he could see this thunderstorm rolling, and he understands what's happening. Again, it's, it's far away, some of it, but he understands what the power of the Lord can do. And so, so here he is doing all this. What is interesting, the Canaanites and, 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 and the heathen of that time, they thought that ba- Baal was the one that, that controlled the storms. They, they, they thought that, that he, he controlled the rain, and if they did certain things, then he would give them rain. If they did certain things, he would control the skies and, the, and, and, and all of the, the climate, you know. And yet this psalm tells us otherwise, doesn't it? God's the one that controls all of that. And, and, and so what we see here is the magnific- ma- magnificence, the m- magnitude of who God is. I can't say that word, but, 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 okay, I heard it back there somewhere. But in his sovereignty and who he is, being all-powerful, and the power of, the, of, of God in his creation and what he does. I love that the word glory is, is used four different times in this psalm. Because David saw this storm, and the storm was God's glory revealed to him. And he sees it in, 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 in effect in, in different areas as, as, as it kind of rolled. And so when he says, give unto the Lord, you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength, Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the, the Lord in, his, in the beauty of, of holiness. What, what's interesting is that David is kind of crying out to the heavens and those who dwell in the heavens because when he uses the word mighty ones, he is talking about the angels in heaven. And, and we already know because we, we could see in, in Revelation chapter five, 4 and 5 when we get this picture of heaven, that it's a place of worship. And, and, and again, Revelation hasn't been written yet, but he understands that in heaven, you, 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 you mighty ones that are there, you angels that are there, you beings that are there, give to the Lord, attribute to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord all of these things. Now, he's not commanding them to do this, but he's telling them, this is what you ought to be doing. And as I thought about that, that he's talking to the angels in heaven to be doing this, how much more should we? Because again, the angels, they've seen the glory of God. They've, uh, they've understood God because they've been with him for all of eternity whenever he created them. But they don't understand the grace of God like you and I ag- understand the grace of God. They watch us, but they don't know, know the grace of God. They've never experienced that grace. How much more should we give unto the Lord? How much should we give Him the glory and the strength, do His name? And and it's interesting when you say that like that because you can worship Him and for all that He is without asking a thing. And just just because of who you are. No matter what's going on in my life, Lord, I want to give you glory and strength because that's who you are. And when we can get to that point when we're up and when we're down... 
to be able to focus on who he is, it kind of takes us away from the stuff that's going on in our life and say, Lord, here I am on earth with all the stuff, but you, there's glory and strength with you. And you're the one that I bow down to. You're the one that I give all of this to because you, you deserve that because of the salvation that you've given to me. It's interesting because when we look at the strength of the Lord, we, we, we almost see it played out from verse 3 to verse 9 because that's the strength of the Lord as we'll cover it in a little bit. But, but, but it's kind of described, the strength of the Lord is kind of described in the storm. And so the power that we see, especially where we live, that sometimes we can experience those storms and the thunder and, and how loud it is. Now, from, I've never been in the Midwest or, or in those areas where it's like, oh my gosh, it's crazy. I did experience one time driving through Texas and the rain was coming down so hard that I had to pull over. And I don't pull over for a lot of stuff. <laughs> but that scared me because the water was so torrential and you're going, oh my gosh. Oh, my God. And it's not like you say, okay, that's enough. Right. You, you, you don't do that. It just comes. So, so the power and the strength that's associated with, with this kind of storm that, that, that King David is, is looking at, and, and he, he's ascribing this, this glory and the strength that ought to be given to his name or to who he is. And then he says, give to the Lord glory that is due his name the awesome brightness and magnificence of who God is. I said that word without even thinking about it. Yeah. But to give him that kind of honor because of who he is, his glory. Because the, his glory, it outshines the sun. It tells us that throughout the Psalms. That when we see the sun, it's the brightest thing. You can't even look at it. That, his, his glory is brighter than that. And so we can worship him for who he is in his brightness and his glory and his awesomeness. And when he says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness, I'm wondering if, if, if David has the priest in mind who, who when they were to enter into the temple, when they were to go into the place, they had to dress themselves in a certain way. And, and it, was, it was the way God ascribed it to them, gave it to them, that this is how you enter my, my presence my holiness, you, you're to put this on. And it's almost like King David is telling, telling the angels, and we don't know how they're dressed, but he's like, make sure you're in proper attire as you're worshiping the God and the beauty of, of his holiness. Make sure that, that, that you are arrayed in glory and in, in holiness at the beauty or the splendor of his holiness. And so he gives us a little glimpse of what the angels should be doing at this time in heaven. And if you've ever had the time to read Revelation 4 and 5 and just dwell in that and, and, and kind of picture what that might look like, it should blow you away to go, whoa. When, when, when all the 24 elders, when, when, when the, the living creatures, and they're all bowing down, they're worshiping, and they cannot stop but worship. They continue and continue. It's just amazing. One, one of the guys that I kind of wrote down here says, true holiness is a beautiful thing to behold. And certainly the greatest demonstration was the life of Jesus as he ministered on earth. He was the holiness of God here on earth. Sin is ugly. No matter what we call it <laughs> to try to downplay our sin, it's ugly. But true holiness, beauty. Beauty. And, and, and true holiness brings glory to God. And so that's what we're called to be doing, even as the angels are called to do that. And so from, from verse 3 to verse 9, it, it, it describes this, this thunderstorm that is happening. And, and he, he begins to tell us that, that about the voice of the Lord. It's mentioned one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. The voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord. And yet, did he hear the audible voice of the Lord? No. It wasn't the audible voice of the Lord. But what he was hearing was this 
storm that was rolling through and he heard the thunder. He saw the lightning. He, he heard the rain. He heard all of that. And he's ascribing that to it being the voice of the Lord. And it's almost like he's watching it from the Mediterranean, wherever he might be standing, but looking to the north, the, knowing that the sea is over there, looking at it and coming towards Lebanon, and then coming across over to uh, Syrian, which is Mount Hermon, which is north of the Sea of Galilee, and, and just watching it go through there. And, and, and it tells us that it goes to Kadesh, and some people, uh, there's a Kadesh down almost 200 miles south, and it's like, man, he saw that a long ways. But, but some, they're saying, no, just north of Damascus, which would be north of Mount Hermon, that there's another city called Kadesh. And so wherever it was, he is watching this thing just go. And he knows what's in Lebanon. He understands what's in, in Syrian. I, I don't know if he had traveled there, but he knew about the trees. He knew about all the stuff that's in there. And he says that the voice of the Lord is over, over the waters. Just the other day, there was a, 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 what is it, a spout out in, the, out, out in the sea. And, and somebody was filming it, man. It's just like gnarly, right? And you're going, you cannot just go over there and go, here, let me stop that. There's a power that's associated with that. There, there, there's this wind that, that's associated with it that can get up to a couple hundred miles an hour. And yet inside, that sto inside the eye, from my understanding, it's like calmness. But it's all around. Everything's just all over the place. And he says, again, if it's out in the Mediterranean, he's seen it, and he says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. To hear that sound of a thunder, it can be scary at times. It can shake you a little bit. It's like, oh. But when you really step back and you're going, man, that is so powerful. The power that is associated with thunder. And so he's talking about how the Lord is over many waters. And he says the voice of the Lord is powerful. And so he is associating the power of God with the power of the storm that he could see as it's coming across. There's this loudness. There's this lightning. There's all of this that's going on. And he says, this is power. The voice of the Lord is powerful. And the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Because he got to a point where he's realizing it's not just nature. It's God that's allowing this to happen. And he's elevated it above just like amazing. It's, it's, it, it's majestic. It's something that is so beautiful even. I, I, and, and I know that we can look at storms and, and, and the power of it. We see the devastation of it and, and all of those things. But in its true form, it's just pure power associated with it. And, and the psalmist is associating it with who God is. That the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. He says, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. And in Lebanon, it's known for its cedars throughout the scriptures. We see that Lebanon is associated with, with, with cedars, these, these firm, these these unshakable type of trees. And yet, the voice of the Lord breaks them. Probably breaks them like toothpicks. And again, when we see this, you know, and, and we see the devastation, we go, man, this tree, they just, it just breaks them like nothing. That's the power of God. That's the power of who He is. And it's almost like it, it's coming across and it's just taking these things and knocking them down like, like toothpicks, you know. The, the, these amazing trees. It says that the thunder basically, it, 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 it kind of skips like a calf <laughs> from Lebanon to, to Sidon. And, and if you know Le the, the, the area, you have the Mediterranean, you have Tyre, which is like Sidon and Lebanon now. And then you, you go several miles and then you start hitting over here where Mount Hermon is at, 
which is here uh, Syrian, that's several miles. It's not hundreds of miles, but it's tens of miles. And so he sees from here and there, it just skipped over, but I'm sure it just kind of took all of that, whatever it was there. And, he, he, and, and he's looking at this and he's going, man, he's splintering these things. It just skips like a calf, like a wild ox. And he says, the voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. And, and one commentary says, this is like, like thunder that goes two different ways, you know, it just like breaks it up like a fork, you know. And you're looking at this, and again, you're, you're thinking about the awesomeness of thunder and the lightning that, 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 that strikes. And he says in verse 8, the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. And he shakes the wilderness of Kadesh, whether it's north or south, however it went, but it shook that place. And, and here, living in, in, in California as we do, some of us experience this kind of shaking when the earth shakes and there's nothing you can do about it. And you're thinking, man, the power that is associated with that. And yet the psalmist is attributing even this kind of shaking in this storm to God, to his voice even. That he shakes all of those things. And I thought verse 9 was, was really interesting that, that, that this, this voice of the Lord, the awesomeness of all of this, it, it makes the animals give birth prematurely even. With the fright, apparently, I don't know. But can you imagine being born in the middle of a storm? I, I don't know if animals understand that or not, but that would kind of be freaky. To, to hear all of this going on as it's coming. And yet, as he says, and, and he describes the storm of, of how it went from here to there and how it, it took care of the trees, the wilderness, and all of these things, even the animals, that, that again, it just kind of blows everything up, it seems like. And then he says at the end here, oh, when he says it strips the, 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 the forest bare, that it just takes all the leaves with it. But he says, and in his temple, everyone says glory. He's talking about the temple of God in heaven. But the angels shout glory. Because glory is due to his name. Because of the brightness of who he is. They cried out glory. In amazement. Understanding the power of God. And who he is. And then in verse 10, he says, The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. The Lord sits as king forever. And he gives us this picture of almost going back in history because he knows history, he understands history. And he takes us back to the days of Noah and the power that was associated with the flood. And that even in that moment, in that time, how, how, how the flood came up from the bottom, from the top, where it came from all over the place, and yet God was the one that was associated with that, nothing else. And it's almost like he takes this time to, to meditate on the fact that when that happened in, in history for him, there was the Lord who allowed all that to happen. That he sat enthroned. In other words, he didn't get knocked off his throne. He sat there and saw it all come to pass. And it was a time of judgment for sure. But even with the time of judgment, he had given the people 120 years to repent. And they didn't. And yet there was these faithful people, eight of them, that God protected. And in this flood that destroyed all the world, all the earth, all of it, everything, he takes care of these eight people. Because that's how powerful God is. To be able to do all of that. As the, as the rain started, as the fountains gave way, and, and it just continued and continued until the time that it stopped, until the time it started to drain, until, until the time that it was brought to a, a rest. And God was the one that took care of that family because he takes care of his people. 
And so here we have this picture of David watching this whole power of God just kind of come through that whole area. And he realizes one thing, and he is the king, King David. But he realizes there's a king that's higher than him. And he says, the Lord, the Lord is the one that sits as king forever. He understood who was in, 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 in charge. Even though he was in charge of, of all that God had given him, he understood who sat above him, who directed him, who he looked to for guidance. In verse 11, it says, the Lord will give strength to his people. And we understand that he's talking to the nation of Israel. We understand that the psalmist is, is concerned about the people of Israel. And yet, we can take that and say, wow, Lord, if you can do that for Israel, can you do that for us? That when the thunders, the, the, the storms and the thunders and the, 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 the earthquakes and, 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 and the hurricanes and all these things, all these things that are beyond our control, that are so powerful that we cannot control. Lord, in that moment, in that time, are you able to give your people strength to go through that, to understand it, Lord, that you will be with your people? In the last portion of that verse, it says, and the Lord will bless his people with peace. And I'm wondering if the storm had already passed or it, it, as, as he's seen that he understands that in the midst of all of that and the power that's associated with all of that, that, that he understands that God will bless his people with peace. Somehow. A, a, a peace that would pass our understanding because when you look at, 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 at a storm so heavy that, that it just continues to move from, from one place to another, that in the midst of that, God is able to, to, to have peace when everything looks like it's being devastated, when everything looks like it's falling apart, that God would say, or that the psalmist would say, and the Lord will, will, will bless his people with peace because that's who he is. King David understood who, who was enthroned. He understood who, who brought this the storm, because he heard the voice of the Lord in all of that aspect. And everything associated with it, it was the voice of the Lord that was so powerful. And yet, I don't think he heard it audibly. He heard the effects of the storm, and yet in the, in the midst of the storm, instead of being afraid of the storm, he heard the vo God's voice through the storm. And in that, there was peace for him. And for his people. And it's after the storm, oftentimes, and we see it beautifully up here, that we end up seeing this rainbow, <laughs> right? And sometimes up here it's just so clear that you're going, man, it's so vibrant. And one of the commentators says, Noah saw the, the rainbow of the covenant after the storm. But he also says, the Apostle John saw it before the storm because he saw, saw it in Revelation chapter 4 before everything breaks apart in the rest of the book of Revelation. And yet he says the prophet Ezekiel saw the rainbow in the midst of the storm in the beginning of the book of Ezekiel. And I think for us... <clears throat> While we're here in heaven, we, all, we, we can only really experience half the promise that God has for us because every time we see a, 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 a rainbow, we only see the ark. And we think that's a full rainbow. It's like, no, it's not. We only get half the promise because a, a, a true rainbow is circular all the way around. And what we see is only half of the promise. I don't know if you've ever been online and you if you can get high enough and people have taken pictures that a rainbow is actually all the way around. And we see that in heaven. That, 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 the, that, that, that the, the, the rainbow goes around the throne. And that's the full promise of God. What we see is only the half promise of God on this side of heaven. But because it's shining the sun and the sun is complete circular. 
But the way it shows up for us, it's only half the promise. And that we can bank on, right? But there's a full promise for us. That one day we will be with him. We will experience all his glory. And we will be like the angels there in, in, in Psalm 29, where we would be saying, give to the Lord, give to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord all that is due his name. Because we have experienced his grace. And if his angels can do all of that, why can't we even more so here on earth, even if we see half the promise, because we're not there yet, to be able to give him all who we are and in the glory of his name. You know, we, we, we're going to celebrate communion. And the reason that we can experience any of his peace, any of his grace, any of those things, is because if you're here tonight and you've accepted the Lord, then, then this means everything to you. Because of the, the death of Christ, who, who, who went all the way to fulfill the promise of God that he would save, that he would send, that, that he would one day have a relationship with his people. We get to experience that, and we want to celebrate that tonight. I, I, I love when we get to do it on Thursday nights because we can change it up. And, and, and again, it's a smaller crowd, so we can just like, you know what, let's just, let's just linger in, in communion. And that's what I want to do tonight. The worship team, if you guys can come on up. And we're going to pass it out, and I want you guys to just hold on to it. And if you're familiar with our Thursday nights, sometimes we just kind of linger with the, with the bread. And I just let whoever wants to pray, pray for the bread. We're not going to pray, pray for Aunt Martha tonight. We're not going to pray for, for anything else except the, br the bread when it's time, and then the cup. Because we just want to worship tonight. Worship his, his holiness because of who he is, because of who he's given us. He's given us Jesus Christ. He came to die for your sins and my sins. We get to celebrate this and remember his death until he comes. And so we want to worship and we want to honor him and give him all that we are because he deserves it all. And we get to just bask in who he is and, and enjoy his peace. I'm going to ask Brian.